Scott County, providing safe, healthy, and livable communities. Uh, good morning, yes. Mr. Yep. Chairman, Commissioners. Um, we're really very excited to have this conversation with you this morning. Uh, this is a uh, uh, Scott County Delivers discussion on our crisis mental health services. And, um, and really our first chance to hear from the folks that are working on our new coordinated response program. Um, as you know, that has been a program that was designed and built to be part of the continuum of mental health services that we've been trying to build in Scott County for the last 10 years. This, um, this program fills an identified gap and many of our um, participants are gonna talk about that today. Um, it is a look, we have I think four months of data for you. So just, I offer that just to keep in context. This is a brand new program and I really applaud this group for being willing to come forward and share the early learnings with you from that project. Um, this is data that a couple of you have requested to appear on that weekly commissioner's dashboard. And so we're working with this group to make that available to you on an ongoing basis, but really wanted to prioritize this conversation first and, and really are interested in, <clears throat> excuse me, in um, your thoughts and, and what else you are, are interested in knowing about. Um, we're going to um, handle this just slightly differently this morning. I'm gonna ask the uh, facilitators to introduce themselves, I'll ask the panel to introduce themselves. We're gonna do some questions. I'm gonna pause and give time for people in the audience to either ask questions or make comments. Um, we have many representatives from this project here today, and I just want to make sure everyone gets a chance to, um, to share their thoughts. Um, and then we'll turn it back over to the commissioners for final comments. I do also want to share your, your comment, um, Mr. Chair, um, welcoming Mayor Williams. She has been a, a longtime advocate for mental health services in this community. We're really happy that she could join us today. So with that, I'll ask you to introduce yourselves. I'm Danny Lenz with the Office of Management and Budget. I'm Lori Huss, Employee Relations. Brad Davis, Planning and Resource Management Director. Carrie Raddus, I'm the Director of the Mental Health Center. Amber Barnes, I'm the Supervisor in Adult Mental Health. Jeff Tate, Shakopee Police. Rodney Sawyer, Savage Police. Lieutenant County Sheriff. Danielle Fox, Health and Human Services Deputy Director. And if you don't mind, I'll pass it over to our second row here. We've got some extra folks that can speak to some of these questions today. I'm Jen Peterson. I'm um, a coordinated responder in the Scott County Sheriff's Department. I'm Jeff Kilkane. I'm the coordinated responder at the Savage Police Department. I'm Jim Sonata. I'm the coordinated responder at the Shakopee Police Department. Katie Pearson, coordinated responder at the jail. Uh, Josh Davis, the investigation sergeant for Shakopee PD. Scott Rickey, I'm the jail administrator. Steve Collins, I'm the operations captain at the Scott County Sheriff's Office. Thank you all very much for those introductions. Uh, Danielle, would you start us off by just giving us a brief reminder about the, the kind of the definition or the parameters of this program? Sure. So today we're covering our behavioral health crisis system response, but there is a strong focus on coordinated response, um, which is a Scott County program, as Chris said, that just started um, most of it in March of this year. So we're excited to have them. Um, coordinated response is similar, but not the same as co-response. It is also a small, um, I think we've even called it a pilot project in Scott County. We're looking at four FTEs. So the difference in coordinated response is that we are typically responding after the fact. It might be the following day, it might be the following Monday, it might be a couple days later, but after some sort of involvement with law enforcement, they can contact our coordinated responders who will then go out and work to provide some outreach and engagement um, with individuals or families that hopefully connect them to resources. Um, we are four FTEs total, so you have our crew back here. Um, it is a small program, comparatively speaking, and we are primarily responding during Monday through Friday, 8 to 4.30. Thank you for setting that, that table for us. All right, I'm going to turn it over to the facilitators for questions. Well, I'll start. Thanks. So on page two, there's a reference, and it's right under the data review um, section, and it says, a po it's quoting, a positive increase in engagement. What exactly does that look like? Can you tell us more about what positive engagement and that increase looks like to you? 
I'll be happy to answer that one. I think of uh, a lot of times law enforcement will go to these calls, and sometimes it's numerous calls a week or a month at these same addresses, the same people. But we're never really, we have nothing in our tool belt to really provide a service. We're kind of putting out that fire, leaving and coming back again. We're now we're like, hey, here's what else we have. And now these folks behind me jump in and actually do some work, connect resources, and make some positive changes. And it's positive for that person, but I think of a specifically one that's right on the Shockley border with us that James is working with. Like the neighbors also are going, wow, there's this program that actually kind of solved this problem that we're having, this neighborhood issue with, with somebody creating a lot of uh, pain for everybody that lived in that in that in that community. So I think it gets seen by law enforcement as positive as well as the community that are observing these behaviors and stuff and knowing that something's being done versus us just showing up and having not a lot of options to fix it. I think if you look at some of the data, um, sort of our before picture is on page 12 where it looks at the engagement rate of um, calls that law enforcement made. So coordinated response is only accessible to our law enforcement partners that we're contracted with. And on page 12, this is the look at sort of pre-coordinated response. So before, in 2022, for example, there were 626 calls made by law enforcement to our Canvas mobile crisis team, which does after hours 24-7 um, work as well. So law enforcement reaches out to them, says there's a mental health need, and only 6% of the time did that result in an assessment. The sort of after coordinated response is on page nine, which shows that their engagement rate is 68%. So when law enforcement contacted coordinated response and said there's an issue, 68% of the time they were able to engage them in the community. And the first question we'll probably get is why is that, especially on that page 12 data. Um, our Canvas mobile health team is really positioned to respond to voluntary <laughs> crisis requests. So if an individual calls on their own behalf and requests services, um, they will typically go out and, and engage them, whereas this team is sort of intended to meet that, that other percent, that 90 plus percent where either the person is maybe not interested in engaging in services, maybe they're not interested because law enforcement is the one offering it. And so they're really trained to go out and do that engagement and try to connect with that person in a way that makes those mental health services more available to them. Uh, how much overlap is there in, in the clients between the Canvas mobile, if they're assisting someone, and then it's also the same um, population that coordinated response is assisting? How do you kind of coordinate that if you're working with the same? Yeah, I would say there's some. Um, so Canvas Health, um, they're able to do um, crisis stabilization, and so I think the, the, the individuals that are voluntary and willing to engage in services, um, Canvas Health is maybe more likely to take those, whereas um, historically the clients that this team in the back row is seeing um, is clients that Scott County has really never engaged with before or has historically um, been pretty avoidant to engage in services. So I think that's kind of how we're deciphering things, but there, there definitely are clients that have overlap. Um, and I guess in my perspective, like the more support, the better. So if we could go to page seven, I, we have a lot of law enforcement presence here and I really want to understand the experience that um, you all are having with this program, how it's impacting the day-to-day -day operations of your officers out on the street. So um, like Chris alluded to, we don't have a lot of months of data here um, and kind of see it, the picture. And so I'm a little bit interested in just kind of what's the experience like, how does it actually work? Um, and then also, are you seeing less people that you're going on repeated calls to? Is that part of a reason for the trend in data? Is it just kind of figuring out the system as we see it? You know, a little bit of a decline for uh, Shakopee and Savage from April to June, understanding there's a lot of reasons for different perspectives. So open up to either chiefs or people that respond out in the field or however that works. <laughs> I, I think I can uh, speak to that. Um, we've seen frequent 911 users uh, prior to that, and it's constantly uh, officers responding to the same location. And like the sheriff stated, there's only so much tools in the toolbox that we have. And bringing on a uh, coordinator response. Oh, she's here. I can't say anything about her. <laughs> <laughs> but. Bringing about the coordinated responder on, on the Savage Police Department has really helped out a lot. It's more of a proactive approach 
than when just reporting it and then we're setting off referrals. <clears throat> because we all know that in the hospital, there's that revolving door. But now it's being more proactive, uh, getting, those getting those who are suffering a mental health crisis the resources that they so badly need. And when I say proactive, uh, when officers uh, respond to an incident where maybe it, it doesn't meet the threshold of a 48-hour hold, um, we provide that information to our, our, our unit, our program, and they respond the very next day, and they see that people care. We've received a lot of positive comments from the community, especially those uh, parents or guardians that um, are, are at a standstill, at a brick wall, as to what they can do, what, how can they help their kids. And having us be more proactive is really uh, cut down the frequent 911 users and, and it, it provided a positive response in the community. In speaking towards, like, I can only talk about establishment coordinator response program because that's the one I'm a part of more so. So we had a large number of referrals in April, and one of the trends of why it's also going down is we take a quick response. So at the beginning, it was um, if someone is experiencing any version of mental health, Jessica gets a referral, the coordinator response team. The coordinator response team gets a referral. And when we looked at those 70 referrals, not all of them actually needed our response, or they already had case management involved, things like that. So we were able to look at some of those and be like, oh, so this isn't a great use of this resource. This is something else we can send them to, or this was a Canvas help call as opposed to a Jessica call. And another trend that you'll notice in May, like when the weather starts to change, mental health starts to change a little bit. Like once it starts to get warm outside, you'll see more people get outside, things like that. Okay, question. Yeah, my question, um, when Scale hired a data analyst, their, their first project was trying to analyze data from law enforcement. And what we learned is that each law enforcement agency did things kind of radically different, or enough difference to, to skew the data and make it so we really couldn't understand the data. Now, here in this data, it looks almost like that we got some of the... A question there is, Shakopee seems to have almost half as many referrals as Savage, and Shakopee's larger. Um, it's like 149 to 87 over these three months. I'm just wondering, is there is there a difference in how law enforcement is responding to this new program? I just would counsel or say, at some point, we need to make it standardized so we can understand the data, and, you know, if we ever want to understand the data. Um, well, I think part of it, you know, it's just a, our priority, there we go, sorry. Um, our priority right out of the box wasn't just give them every single mental health call that um, officers go on. We have some, and the sheriff alluded to one individual in particular that, you know, we've spent years and years and years dealing with uh, another individual in, in town. And I remember sitting down with Jameson and saying, Look, I don't expect you to solve this in one week or one month because we haven't solved it in five years. But we need a different lens and a different focus. So it's more, we have some very, very severe cases um, that are taking up an extraordinary amount of resources or have in the past. It's occupied a lot of his time. So I think it, it's more focusing on, on our biggest, most repeat individuals as opposed to, okay, let's get as much as we can on, on his plate. We're trying to, and things have evolved a little bit in terms of what we use him for uh, in four months. We knew that would happen. Um, it, I'm not surprised. Uh, Savage calls Canvas a lot more than our officers do. So I'm not surprised that at this, this data, I'm not surprised that the, um, I kind of want to go back to the, the previous question just to comment a little bit. Um, I'm not surprised at the success that this has had right out of the gate and, and the feeling from law enforcement. I know Rodney and I have talked about this for several years. We've seen our counterparts in Dakota County, Hennepin, Ramsey have this program for years. And the partnership that was able to be developed between our cities and the counties and the funding to be able to get this accomplished, it's worked everywhere else. Why shouldn't it work here? 
And just real quickly, it's interesting, the performance evaluations that we read in May, early June, where officers provide feedback. The number of individuals in our department that talked about this program in a positive light on those evals. We've also had a number of uh, retirements in the last six months in our, in our department, actually the last couple months. There are exit interviews. These are officers that have been here for decades and them stressing how grateful they are and how important this program is and happy that they're, they're seeing this resource here uh, in the department moving forward, I think speaks volumes. Um, they, there's a lot they could complain about or wish they had or those types of things, but here's something that um, that's working and, and both the outgoing officers know it and our current officers uh, see that value as well. But I, I'm not surprised or um, I think it's just a different focus right out of the, the gate in terms of and some of the severity of, of our cases. Um, I can't speak to Savage's cases, but they're very time consuming that, that we've got them working on. This trigger another question. On a, a previous slide, there, it was the statement given, we don't count uh, one person that has many referrals more than once, it's, we don't duplicate them. I hope somewhere you are counting that as the total number because when you come and say we're overwhelmed and we need another staff person, you're gonna have to say, here's how many total contacts or total referrals because it, it, multiple times for one person it still takes, obviously, I would guess, time. Yeah. yeah, the one thing I'll add um, to the prior question is when we looked at implementation of this program, we looked at a number of different models. And what we found out is that every community is a little bit different. Every city was a little bit different. Every county was a little bit different. Um, and nobody was right or wrong, right? Like these individual jurisdictions have their individual needs. And I think... We intentionally had one FTE, one person tied to that jurisdiction so that they could work together to figure out what works for that team. So as was spoken to, I think the focus is a little bit different, but generally speaking, there's sort of this overall availability to meet those needs. We are, I think, working on our data development um, as well. A lot of this is hand counted. I think we hope that over time we can improve that data collections and the systems that can hopefully automate some of that to make it more available. Final kind of a follow up from what you said, Chief Tate, about looking at the performance. So, if we focus like 10, um, you know, we have kind of the satisfaction survey, and again, we're doing a short amount of time. Um, you realize that's a changing program, but obviously, the results are really positive right now. Uh, so, just between the law enforcement agencies that use it and you, Danielle, or the uh, coordinator response team, what's kind of that review process to make sure we're one, meeting the needs of the law enforcement as well as um, helping to educate them on the different paths that maybe it should go down where we do have those cases where maybe it didn't quite need the coordinated response need, there was another resource. Or maybe how you look at the, the process going in the future. I think you have to have the buy-in. You have to have the buy-in from the department and the boots on the ground. And the, the buy-in's already there. When Jessica came in, we started working together and the constant whether it be at um, briefings or uh, at night with the officers coming together and working out a strategic plan of how to deal with a certain subject that, that, that needs the resources badly. Uh, we worked just recently, we worked with a homeless person, get the um, uh, resources that is needed, everybody working together. Uh, we worked with one who was involved in domestic violence and had a child and of course, it, the mental health issues that come along with that. We we're able to put together the resources and come with a plan, a plan of action. So having that buy-in is huge. And I think the officers see that and they saw it right away. And I, I, I don't think there's not enough hours in a day for Jessica to respond to all these cases that we have out there. Um, I, th I think we need more, to tell you the truth. And I'm hoping that throughout Scott County, that everybody will come on board and and it, it's positive, very positive. I think we do hope that th this program is not the be all end all, right? Like we don't want to be providing all the mental health services, but we want to be a support to law enforcement. Um, and I think over time, there's some trust that needs to be rebuilt that because I think law enforcement obviously has been reaching out for mental health support for a long time and sometimes nothing happened. And so part of that is getting that buy-in of the officers and really figuring out what their needs are and how we can support them. 
But I think on the flip side of that, as we work through this program development, we'll figure out the right calls that are meant for Canvas, the right calls that are meant for this team. Um, are there other resources that we can just readily make available to folks so that there's not a dependency on this, on this crew? Because as was stated, there's just not enough hours in the day. So it's about building up those resources, that knowledge, that education, and that trust so that we can work collaboratively together. So um, part of my job here at Scott County is continuous improvement. And that, like, I absolutely celebrate the work that you are doing. But I also look at, you had some surveys that were less than positive. And I'm wondering if you can tell me about um, what you know about spaces where people have given you opportunity to make improvement. Yeah, I would say the majority of the um, growth conversations from the survey results uh, were around feedback. Law enforcement officers were wanting to know what is the update? What did you guys do for this individual? Um, what's going on? They, they want an update. But because of data privacy and HIPAA laws and things like that, if there's not a signed release in place, we legally can't tell an officer an update. We can't give them information about their diagnosis, the treatment plan, things like that. So there are different rules um, and things that we've had to follow and kind of get creative on. Um, we've looked at like a messaging system of how we could send like a message update, but keep it vague enough to be like HIPAA compliant. But we haven't essentially solved that problem. But yeah, that that was. The, the common theme from um, some of the feedback of like law enforcement officers wanting updates. So, uh, just a hopefully brief follow up because I'm talking too much already here. Uh, so I know that in some past Scott County delivers, there's been some really positive feedback with officers engaging with people that are involved in the criminal justice system in some way or another, going out, understanding a little bit what's going on in their lives. So has there been a push to try and get people to sign those releases so that say this officer knows what's going on? They're going to come, they're going to have compassion for you. They're going to be able to say, hey, have you called your caseworker? Have you called you know, anybody when they're showing up? Just because I have heard that in some of our um, specialty court stuff where that officer to officer or the person in the public's connection can really have an impact. So Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we definitely encourage releases, but of course we can't force anyone to do something. Um, but we are able to put an alert on their um, like chart or I think you call it like jacket um, that says like coordinator response is involved um, or we can give tips and tricks to officers of like individual um, does best with a soft voice or, you know, like a female officer or whatever. Um, so we are able to put alerts on people's charts, which has been super helpful. And I think also has eliminated some of that duplication of referrals. Um, but the downside of that is um, our team, there isn't a way for us to get alerted when law enforcement has gone out for a second time if they don't send a, another referral or another Dynaform is what we call them. So again, we're trying to navigate and evolve this program, but um, yeah, some of those hiccups are definitely present. So I had a question on page 14. So this is data from the mental health center that looks at their availability to respond to crisis appointments for, pe for people in crisis. Your material today talks about the volume of people being referred to coordinated response is, is sizably larger than what you anticipated as you were designing this. And so I'm wondering then, as you are going out and engaging with people, do we have the resources to respond to those crises? Like what, how is this kind of data, this and other data sets gonna be impacted by this? So we, we can respond to uh, a with a crisis appointment. Where we're challenged a bit is um, many of the referrals need a formal diagnostic assessment, and those require quite a lot of time from a, our therapist. So we have prioritized these clients, along with all of our clients who uh, need to be qualified for uh, case management, adult and children. Um, but it is a, it's, I think we've talked in this meeting before about that's a challenge because um, uh, especially for people on Social Security, only certain license levels can do that. And so we um, are continually talking about how to make that process efficient. In terms of the crisis, though, if they have a crisis um, referral, we, we must and do see those people as soon as the people make themselves available to us. It's just the, the follow-up on the formal diagnosis that can be a challenge. Okay. 
But you spoke to the estimated uh, volume that we, we thought was coming our way, which we looked at the law enforcement calls to our mobile crisis team, which th that year was over 400. And so we thought, okay, we're serving a subpopulation of Scott County. We're serving three of those jurisdictions. Um, let's just say that there is an increase because people, it's, it's shiny, it's new, and people are connected to it. So let's say we've got between four and 500 that we're anticipating coming to coordinated response for the whole program for the full year. Uh, we're, we're substantially higher than we expected even a couple months in. So I think that was startling for us. Um, the other piece that you talked about was do we have enough resources afterwards? So this is sort of the connector. This is the person identifies the individual or family in the community, but typically they are serving as a liaison, connecting them to the mental health center, connecting them to Canvas and some other community service providers. Um, I think we are concerned generally about community resources and their capacity. In particular, our community service providers that are drastically challenged right now with workforce and so we've been struggling with things like referrals to residential or community placements and supports um, because our provider network is just really struggling to have enough people to deliver the services another key area is psychiatry so for many of the people that are seen by crisis services medication is a is a top need and we're working right now to increase our um, psychiatry hours in the mental health center as well as making a specific appointment with access for our um, coordinated response team. So I'm going to jump in there because I know workforce challenges are expected to continue. So what is the impact of programming if the current state of workforce shortage is the reality going forward? I think that makes us really nervous. Um, I, I think it means that we might see more people show up in places like the jail or with law enforcement where they haven't been connected to some of those community supports sooner. Um, and then we end up, I think, with more of those cases like that you see on page six that outlines our pre-petition screenings and commitments. You know, ideally when someone presents with a mental health need, they get the lowest level of intervention needed to meet their need. Um, and unfortunately that sometimes just doesn't happen when we don't have that um, community resources built up. I'm going to go back to page five. Um, the estimated number of mental health professionals in Scott County, I think that's a positive trend, you know, the last three or four years, the real increase. And it looks like more and more of those are in the private sector, not necessarily public employees. Um, what are you, are you seeing that trend continue? Do you think we'll continue to see a lot more of the private professionals coming into the county or or is that a trend that we might see level off? I think some of the challenges with this data point is that we might have people living in Scott County. They might not be working in Scott County. The reality is right now that the licensed professionals that are providing this level of mental health services across the board um, are hard to come by. There is a huge shortage. And so even um, when we have staff who have um, licensed credentials, there are hospitals or healthcare agencies or other private mental health um, organizations who are contacting them on a regular basis and saying, come work for us. Um, and sometimes they have a lot better benefits than even we offer as a county entity, uh, let alone some of our nonprofit partners. So there's just a reality behind that. Um, I, I, I hope and I think I've heard from these guys that this is work that they are really driven to do, that they feel um, is incredibly powerful and impactful on the population. Um, and so I think that with our partnership with law enforcement and um, the mental health center and other community partners is really valuable in maintaining that current workforce, knowing that that's sort of the environment that we're in right now. Another thing that we kind of talked about related to the increase in mental health professionals in the, in the county, um, it, private practice often um, are doing telemed and they're not necessarily serving Scott County. Um, some are, of course, and some are, are located here. There's also um, many of the clients that they serve and that we serve are um, sometimes not suited to a private practice kind of um, provider. There's a lot of coordination, a lot of um, work among professionals um, and um, different kinds of services with these clients who have some really um, big needs. And those are not things that private practice mental health professionals tend to be involved in or are able to because they're not they're not um, paid they're not reimbursable services 
So we've tried to brainstorm how do we um, grow our own talent, how do we recruit, um, you know, do we have volunteer opportunities or internships um, that can really pull some of that talent to Scott County so we can get them integrated within our system and hopefully they'll be um, someday working for us or one of our local community partners. But besides that, I think the point from the community indicator is it's a good thing, right? There's more private providers. Oh, yes, we good. want to bring those resources in. And as I think that's the point of this from a community indication. There are more resus resources accessible now. Um, of course, we always want the best. I'm not disagreeing with that. I think we have that. But it's a good thing, right, that we have more because what we used to hear was mental health center or nothing. And now there are other opportunities for people. So it appears that data is trending, Dr. Raditz or Daniel, in the right direction. I think as we're seeing those community mental health resources grow, I think that's always a great thing. I think some of our challenges are who are they accessible to? And so I think some of the individuals that we're serving here at Scott County are those that maybe aren't going to be good candidates or this sort of service isn't available to them. But yes, absolutely, these are the resources that could grow that in some cases, these folks can just refer them out and they've got their needs met elsewhere. Can we shift the conversation a bit to the jail social worker? Um, that is um, a position that we talked a lot about last year. Um, and so could we go to page 11? Oh, thank you, Evan. Um, so I guess I'd like to just give uh, uh, Scott or Luke or Katie the opportunity um, to just respond um, to how this position has changed since the recommendations of the jail study. And um, clearly there's a trend down, and, and I'm interested in you talking about why there's a reduction in the number of referrals. Yeah, I'll start it off. So as uh, Chris mentioned, we talked about this position a lot during the jail study, how we'd had a part-time position for a couple years through a different grant, and how it really had proved itself as a need for the staff, for the inmates, for everybody involved. Um, so now that we're running full-time, I mean, the feedback from staff, from people leaving our custody and knowing they're connected to resources, and then lastly, an idea that we didn't even think, imagine when we were first talking about the jail social worker was making her part of this team. And it really makes sense when you think of somebody in the community may end up in our jail or somebody in our jail is definitely going to go back in the community in a short period of time. And having these social workers all networked and sharing information has been super helpful. Um, I think the data points here could be explained with a bunch of reasons, but it's also a pretty small subset, you know, 50 to 38. Um, but definitely our adult population in our jail has gone down a little bit since this winter. Um, so we're averaging probably closer to 95 to 100 inmates a day and previous to that. And we're actually uh, have, have lost probably I'd say 15 inmates a day almost during that time. So there's probably a direct correlation there. Um, the unknown, the part that we could never prove, but it could be that the coordinator responders in the field are reducing the amount of arrests that come into the jail as well for some of these kind of nuisance crimes. And I think of the case I talked about before, Somebody that's coming onto our radar multiple times a week due to neighborhood concerns, there's a good chance they're going to come to jail eventually because something's going to trip, you know, because of that and all those interactions. So there also could be some interactions there that a couple less people here and there getting arrested because they're getting treated through a coordinated response could turn into that number as well. It's not, not able to prove it that way, but that's what it feels, I think. But that'll be a piece to watch going forward as well. Yeah. Totally. Thanks. <laughs> No, I, I would just add to what the sheriff said. I, I think he's spot on. I do think um, population-wise, um, we, we are a little bit lower, and, and so you would see just a, uh, less referrals that way. Um, beyond that, I, uh, I, I do think that the, po the, the program has gotten more uh, word of mouth through the facility. And so um, internally, I think we need to look at just th that workflow and the process of how referrals are getting to you. I don't know, I don't know um, enough yet to, to decide if, if, uh, if people are just making act, taking active steps on their own from a staff perspective. So, yeah. So oh, Scott, on page 11, it talks about how all of that, the referrals and the work, is to have success after they leave the jail. Is there any early indicators? I know I know the stats are, are, are we're, we're young in this, but are, are there indicators of what helps people to be successful or challenges for them not being successful as they leave jail? 
I don't know, Katie, you want to speak to that? I, I think. Um, and I think that can be a really wide range. I think about, you know, even just in the last week, there's been individuals who, you know, they're incarcerated, they lost their job, they need help with background, they need to get insurance going, they need to, you know, get a phone, all of these things. And then there's individuals who I've met with that all they needed was health insurance, but that was such a key part to get things going that I think it's, you know, looking at the recidivism rates and then also just looking at what that need is of the person and what they want to work on and what their goals are as well. So I'll piggyback on what Laura was talking about for staffing, and this is on the very last slide, page 17. It's about our ERTS facility that um, obviously was a big project for the county a few years ago. Um, and we're seeing a decline in Scott County clients and total clients. Can you just talk to a little bit about the challenges there? Yeah, I mean, we've heard from them directly uh, multiple times over that a lot of this is tied to workforce. Um, the Ertz and Crisis Facility is a 24-7 residential service. And each service, crisis or Ertz, intensive residential service and treatment services, requires different levels of staffing. And so it depends if they've got somebody able to work overnights in the foreseeable 10 days, if they can admit somebody to a crisis bed. Um, that matters. So I think they are just really struggling to maintain um, the, the general day-to-day -day staffing of that facility, and that really impacts their capacity to take on new clients. How is that impacting our either work through coordinated response or other places? I know we have the Anoka treatment facility. What kind of how is that impacting the continuum overall? Well, I think we're lucky in Scott County in that we have priority of beds, and so um, I don't know that we've run into a situation where we have somebody who is a good fit that could come down to the Ertz or Crisis from Anoka that has not yet been there. Um, the challenge that we are seeing with individuals who are at the Anoka Regional Treatment Center um, that are no longer meeting criteria are that they're not appropriate for our Earths and Crisis facility. Their needs, their behaviors, um, perhaps their criminal history just are not a good match for this facility. And so I think that's where we see people waiting. Um, overall, this service was intended to be that step up, step down. So it could be that that these folks are having to wait um, longer than we would like to get them into the local Earths and Crisis facility. It could mean they have to explore some other sites. Um, again, we are lucky in that we have priority and that if there is someone who they deem not acceptable, they have a conversation with us to see, you know, what, what, what isn't working for them? How could we support them in a better way to make it work? So, go ahead, Lori. Can we go to page 16? So when I looked at this, that what, what occurred to me was, it's showing that ADP is down, but when I watch the news, it seems that crime is everywhere. So can you help me make sense of this data? Is our community safer now than they were in 2008? Last year was our record low crime rate for the city of Shakopee. Um, we just got our numbers from June. So the, our first six months, we compared to our six months in 22, our first six months in 2023 are lower than our record year last year. So um, I think there's a lot of reasons for that in terms of, um, and I, I think some crimes are going to continue to go down with new legislation. Um, we're not going to be able to search vehicles the way we, we used to with the marijuana law that's been passed, and you're, you're just not going to see crimes um, and the arrests that you did previously uh, for some of some of the uh, uh, guns uh, and drug offenses. Sure. Um, nationally, though, yet every study you see is somewhere between 25 and 33 percent of every uh, call an officer goes on has some kind of mental health uh, component, somebody in crisis. So um, that is not going away. Our crime is down in Shakopee, but our calls for service are slightly up. Mm -hmm. We're not at a 30 low, year low in, in calls for service. Sure. So it's really different in terms of um, how officers are triaging cases and, and calls for service, and, and it's, it's just changed. The calls are there, they're more time consuming, mm -hmm. but the actual reported crime is, is down. So would you say that number is misleading? Is that what I heard you say? I, I think it's, 
misleading, absolutely. I, and we addressed this with our, our council had the, the same questions because, again, our calls for service aren't going down. They're going up You guys slightly. are just as busy as always. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It, we're spending more. Thankfully, we're able to spend more time on calls for service. But the actual number of reported crimes and the number of people we're booking in the jail are, are near all-time lows or all-time lows. So it's really their different stories. Mm -hmm. yep. How we do everything now is quite different than what it was in 08, as was put in this slide. Okay. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Just a comment. But yeah, Commissioner Albuquerque has a question. You know, as I look at the uh, mental health um, percentages and the population of the jail, it, sometimes it looks like about a third of the jail population is getting mental health referrals. I, I want to go back historically. This is long ago history, I guess. Um, I, I, I remember he, um, hearing from Dakota County about all their programs that they offer in, in our jail. And I've been involved with the jail programming, you know, on a volunteer basis for about 20 years. But, but I was very impressed with that, the amount of program they had in the jail. And it's all um, geared towards having somebody released from jail be more successful on a better course, better path. And so I guess I'm wondering, the social worker that's been hired in the jail, I'm hoping there's a link between that person and programming. In other words, that maybe there can be some social work-sponsored programming in the jail that would help with this issue. So any comment on that? Or Yeah, I would say it really overlaps. Before we had two program officers were just corrections officers assigned to help with programming. During our staffing shortages, they got pulled to work shifts. Now we're back up and running with that, and Katie really rounds that out, right? She's able to work with, as people are doing some more of that reentry kind of feel, not only helping them in the building, but helping them reintegrate when they, when they come back out. So a lot of that is really getting smoothed out, and we're learning a lot more. And she comes with a different skill set than a corrections officer would have on, on understanding some of those issues and resources available. So I think we're seeing a lot of... A positive moves there of getting people back on their feet is simple as we've talked about even getting them home when they don't have a ride and not have them wandering around downtown Chacopee when they leave the jail you know we're reducing further crimes by doing little things like that but um, really understanding those issues like I said around simple stuff as insurance or other things like that help help them get the process going so when they go home that'll that'll take action actually versus them going home with with even less resources after they've been in custody Mr. Chairman, Commissioner Ulrich, I, I'm glad I get to meet the famous Katie because <laughs> I, I sat through, I don't know how many jail study meetings, far less than most of these guys, and all I heard was this Katie, 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 and you guys talk about passion for a job. She changed jobs to take this job to be a social worker in the jail, and so I think it goes to the heart of some of our employees and how much they care. But Katie, could you talk a little bit about that coordination? Because from Scott to other people in the jail to Chris would come back and Pam Selvig, and it, I, I, they couldn't say enough. So I'm glad you're here today. But talk a little bit about that so we hear some of that. A coordination between myself and the jail or? <laughs> the programming and that tie that you bring, that you're, you're kind of a little bit of that glue that. that well, so I actually office with the programs officers, which I think has been incredibly helpful just for us to discuss with one another, you know, what are you working on? What are we working on? How can we help each other? I know, you know, like, for example, the programs officers work with the work release individuals, and they're out during the day most days. So often, I won't even know who these people are. And they've been really good advocates of this person really needs help, but they never get a chance to see you. How can we make this work? Um, going backwards a little bit to a previous question too about you know reentry outside of the jail too. Anyone who meets with me, I give my card. They can call or email me once they're out. I would love it if all my referrals were 100% successful once people got out. But I always tell people, you know, things happen. You know, appointments get missed, things don't get followed up on. Give me a call. We'll keep working on it. Um, I think I mean since day one, the jail has been really. I feel the jail's been really receptive to having me there. They've Everyone's been really supportive from leadership to the correctional officers. And I think I the coordination's worked really well for me. I have a time for one more question. Chris. Yes. 
in the packet, you, there's a, a mention of exploring additional partnerships, and I'm assuming that might be additional cities beyond just Shakopee Savage and the Sheriff's Department. So talk to me a little bit about that. What, what does that exploration look like? What would it take to bring in a, a Bell Plain, a Jordan, a New Craig, help a new market into this type of program? Well, so this group has uh, a shared working group and a shared executive group. And so I think the, the key part of what makes this work is that partnership. Um, and then there's the financial model behind the program, which we were able to secure grant funds that supported these staff in their first year. But then there is a joint financial contribution from the cities or the jurisdiction um, and Scott County to help pay the ongoing salary and benefits. And so I think we're in a good position right now if there is another partner that would like to join um, and if the board is interested in that because there is some additional funds that have been dedicated through the legislative session um, that could help support that. I believe um, these teams can speak better than I can, but it was the <coughs> opioid settlement dollars that came to some of the cities that really provided that um, seed money to help move this along. Is there any city in particular that's kind of reached out and is trying to learn more about your experiences? I've heard the buzz that Prior Lake is interested, but no formal connections. But um, I know, especially in the Savage Prior Lake High School, um, there's a lot of overlap of kiddos that um, Jessica can't help because their Prior Lake is their address, right? Um, but they go to high school. Um, is Prior Lake High School technically in Prior Lake yes. or Savage? Savage. Savage. Okay. <laughs> See, it's, it's all a blurred line. Like, no one really knows. Um, and that's how I feel about the kids in the school, too. Like, no one really knows, like, what, oh what side are they on? Whose jurisdiction takes precedence? So if the referral comes from Savage, we can help and get involved. But if it's a Prior Lake kiddo, unfortunately, we can't. So that's kind of an example. That buzz has been garnered from <laughs> the buzz of those other agencies that Amber is referencing have come from a lot of officers having friends on other police task force. So a lot of Savage officers do a lot of, um, I think it's called agency assists, where they go and help Prior Lake or um, like other agencies will help other agencies. And that's where this has also come into question where Prior Lake has had some mental health crises and they've... They know Savage has me. So they're like, oh, it's Jessica Free. But we have to say no because Savage has the buy in. Savage has the coordinator responder, not Prior Lake. So that's also been a conversation that we've been having in our jurisdictions. I think ideally we would have the same opportunities, right? No matter where you live in Scott County. But I think that the challenge we're in right now is one, we're piloting, we were testing this out. Um, we were in a place where we had some one time funding that we could make use of. And so I think we're seeing things and, and it's working well. And so there, if there is that interest, we're certainly open to that conversation. I think just real quickly on that, though nationally, I mean, this is seen as a best practice mm -hmm. model in the industry. Mm -hmm. And especially this spring, we didn't unfortunately get to jump on it, but <coughs> noticing a lot more federal grants for this type of programming. So that is something I know our city grant coordinator has got her eye and focus on, but I do think that there is more funding opportunities. You alluded to um, one of them moving forward for this type of program. I hope it does expand because, again, this is a, a best practices approach. Uh, I think that's been well recognized nationally now. So beyond then the stats, what says it's working? Like what are some of those human, we know it's working? Well, I can tell you if Luke... Rodney and I surveyed our officers and 70 whatever 3% said it was strongly agree and support. There's not, not really a program we have where you're going to get that kind of, of buy-in. I think that is, that is really speaks volume. You know, cops can be a little jaded uh, and, and opinionated. And for them to be that, you know, focused on something like this right out of the gate says that. And, and again, this is new in its four months of data. Mm -hmm. Dakota County, Hennepin County, I mean, they've, every agency has one, and, and the agencies that do have them, I know several in Hennepin County that are expanding. They want another uh, uh, employee in the building. So you don't get that if the programs and that kind of replication throughout, if it's not working. Mm -hmm. So I think just, yeah, the replication, the desire to add and, and um, 
look at these these calls for service differently is is what's propelling a lot of this and and why we wanted it so badly maybe we should pause here and and um, there's a microphone uh, I think somebody Tracy was going to help us with that but I'd like to offer um, anybody in the audience who has a question or a comment hi um, Chair and members of this committee, I just wanted to, to talk a bit more about the funding situation because um, opioid money was available to everyone. Savage and Shakopee chose to actively get this money to do this pilot project. Um, the other cities didn't, so that's, what, that's the difference in the service and what's happening in the county and, of course, in, in cooperation with the county. I'll ask a question. Uh, <laughs> oh, Leslie. Oh, sorry. Barb, help me here, or Sheriff. I don't believe the smaller cities received opioid dollars. I believe no, it was. No, they a, didn't. You had to apply for them. They couldn't. The way it was allocated out, it came based on population. So, yeah. Yes. Yeah, I think that's that's correct. I think yeah, based on population size. One of the questions I guess I have is when we were first looking at this model and kind of de trying to decide between coordinated and co-response, where you're going out with law enforcement. And when we had talked to Woodbury in Dakota County, they said coordinated was a really good way to kind of step in and phase into this. Now that we've you know, we're fresh into like month five. Um, any any thoughts on like as far as does the, does coordinated feel like the right, I guess, dose of support? I don't feel we're locked into one way or another. If if it if Jameson needs to hop in with an officer, he can do it. Um, mm -hmm. There are certain follow up calls that he does do, including with our overdose. Uh, anybody we've narcanned. Um, he does a follow-up visit with them, uh, with plainclothes officers, uh, Sergeant Davis. Um, I don't think I don't feel like we're locked into it no. one way or another. Whatever we label the program, I, I think it. We can. I wouldn't get caught up on labels. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say it had it's had a very natural um, ebb and flow of like some some scenarios need a call response for sure, and some are. Like we don't need an officer present, so it's ha it's had it's been a very natural flow of communication, and um, which I think has been great. And I think earlier when we looked at the co responder, the the issue I saw was that would only cover say forty hours a week. You know, if we hired an extra deputy and had a social worker paired up, they could go help in the cities as well. But that's forty hours a week, and then they're kind of done where this team is, you know, tackling those problems behind the scenes. You know, it's four hours a week, but they're gathering anything that happened overnight, anything that happened over the weekend, and, and working on that, not just waiting for an emergency to happen. So it could be in the future in addition to this kind of background, but I think this is a more effective way to start it and get some accomplishments. I think we also know um, there are some big things coming our way. Um, we have the implementation of 988 happening naturally, nationally, um, which will essentially be the equivalent to 911 with police and fire. So if there's a police and fire response, you call 911. The idea that um, soon uh, you'll be able to call 988 and you'll receive a response. Um, I'm not sure we're quite there yet in having that, um, but we know that that's coming. There's potentially, again, some of those funding opportunities that partner with that. And we just might need to look at some internal um, Scott County continuum efficiencies, knowing that we're dealing with those resource shortages in uh, finances and in staff. So we might need to reshuffle that deck a little bit. Other comments or questions from the audience or from on the team members in the second row. Is it brief? It will be very brief. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we were asked to present some success stories anyway. Um, I've been working with a 19-year-old since the inception of our program, essentially. Um, he is a, grew up in Savage, resident of Savage, has schizoaffective disorder, which means he has psychosis, where he's hearing and seeing things. But he's also got a mood disorder, so he has really high highs and really low lows. In the course of the 
four-ish months of me working with him, it started from not wanting any care, what we would call service resistant. Um, it was him driving off in his truck through his neighbor's lawns. It was him driving all hours of the night, not sleeping, high on marijuana. Um, it was him not taking his medication. Through this program, we were able to coordinate with his psychiatrist, his primary care provider, to get him an injectable. When the injectable didn't work, we got him to a hospital. The hospital set up aftercare, and I was there to follow through with that aftercare to make sure that he was set up for success. So it's now gotten to a point where he was recently petitioned for commitment um, through Ramsey County because he got an apartment in White Bear Lake, but he comes down to Savage where his parents still live. And he was able to sign up for a variety of resources and with my assistance, and now he's able to take his medications on his own. And he wants to continue to live independently, but he is also one of those people we're waiting for staffing to get an ERTS bed. He's been on our ERTS wait list for a couple weeks now. So we're hoping that we'll bridge the gap and that we'll make it so full circle he's able to be a surviving independent human. Thank you. That was helpful. With that, Mr. Chair, I think I'll turn it back to you. Okay. Thank you. Are there any additional questions? I see Commissioner Brennan. I'm just curious. Um, when you talked about the Savage um, Prior Lake School, how many calls um, do you say that you go into the schools um, and work with the students? Okay. Calls for service at Pearl Lake High School? Oh, any of the cities, Shakopee or, or uh, do you know, do you keep, do you go into the schools and work? Well, well, having a school resource officer embedded in the Pearl Lake High School, which is in Savage, by the way. <laughs> uh, it, it, really, it really helps. And we do keep track of every student we come in contact with. We do keep track of that. Um, as far as mental health, goes they do have um, um, social workers within the school um, you know that, that's a that's a city within a city I don't think they have enough to tell you the truth uh, social workers that is but um, I think a lot of times our school resource officer will get up with uh, with Jessica and get some um, get some pointers and some advice on how to deal with with uh, uh, some of the kids that are really struggling uh, so that has helped out a great deal. We do have data from our mobile mental health crisis team, which shows the referrals that come in from schools looking for a mobile assessment to come out. Mm -hmm. um, there's there's very few. Uh, we can share that data, but I think there's fewer than you would expect. I think primarily, um, as you said, there are resources within that school, and so um, many of them provided through our, our Scott County Mental Health Center where they would go sort of to the resource that's on site there first. But sometimes uh, they do reach out to our mobile crisis team. Mr. Recky. Great. Thanks, everybody. I, I know that this has been a lot in four months, really exciting work. And I, just a few, I don't think I have any questions, but a few things I heard today that really spoke to me. You know, I, I, I get that our different police departments have different culture, different processes, different personality, and I, they're going to, this is going to evolve differently. And that's the challenge with having the consistent data. So I just hope we really let these programs be the best that they can be without trying to hamper it because we're looking for consistent data, yet I know we need the data. So it, it may look a bit different. Um, Chief Tate, when you said, you know, well, this is sometimes a, a co-responder model. I'm like, yes, good, because I don't think we have to put it into a box and we need to, I mean, we have to follow laws and regulations and things and, and grant requirements, but let's make this the best we can be. So I'm just really happy to hear that it, it can and is evolving a little bit different. Um, hearing about the, I hope we can can increase the the ability to get signed releases because I'm sure that that interaction between between you you people, the social workers and the officers, for our hardest t clients in the toughest situations is just important because this this is not going to be a one-time thing. Oh, one time we gave them these resources and now they're all better. Um, so that continued talking. I hope we can find find some, some ways to improve that. Um, and then I just wondered about I, I, challenges with kind of the 8 to 430 model. Are there folks that, you know, they're, they're not – you're not connecting with them because maybe they have a job, maybe they're at a place where you can't get to. What thoughts on that? How might that evolve? So there is a question. Go ahead. 
<laughs> um, so eight to four thirty is a really beautiful model for anybody who works in this field. So you can have a really good home work life balance. I will agree that mental health does not live in an eight to four thirty world. Um, but the part of being a co-responder or a coordinated response is that we get to follow up the next day and we do try really hard to meet people where they're at. So if they work in eight to four thirty, I've stayed late to be like, okay, you get home from work at five, I'll be there at five, I'll flex my time, and my supervisor is very supportive in that. And I've done ride-alongs at night to see what that looks like to build rapport with my police department. But I also would argue when we have another person coming in who isn't trained like a police officer, I don't know if I'm comfortable going out on call response, mental health calls in the middle of the night due to my sleep depravity. I don't know if that's a good fit for me. I can't speak for my team, but I do know when I have the follow-up, a lot of our officers will say, person works 8 to 4.30, you'll have to call else other times, or works overnights. You know, we get a lot of that data from our officers so we can connect with them at the appropriate time. Thank you. I think it's been a lot about drawing those boundaries, right? Like we want to make sure that we're protecting our staff and not burning them out, but we also recognize um, there are needs beyond that model. I think what also helps is that uh, it's mandated that all of our officers receive the crisis intervention training, the 40-hour course. And we started that back in 2014, where all law enforcement within Scott County in partnership with the Mittawakanton Sioux community started that, uh, um, sending officers to the crisis intervention training. And now we continue that today. And I think that helps in the evening when officers have that training. And they know that it's going to be followed up on the next day. So they'll, they're able to de-escalate and calm people down in knowing that there's going to be help coming your way. And I think that really helps. Okay, anyone else? Commissioner Beer. Thank you very much. Uh, this is a heavy lift, no doubt about it, and super intriguing uh, to be sure. I, I just wanted to, just page one, quickly just look at... Um, the goal you are trying to accomplish, and just maybe open that up just a little bit and ask a question, it says individuals in need of crises resources can access them safely and timely so that they can thrive in the community. That's a great goal. I'm just curious with the jurisdictions that we have in different departments, it, it just seems like that, you know, for such a big um, project and such big lift, is there such a thing as an internal goal that you're trying to accomplish as well as an external goal, you know, out in the community? I mean, obviously the answer is yes, but is there any way that you can elaborate more on what your internal goals, especially if different departments, see the three guys with three very shiny badges, but different departments also, like, hey, this is, a, oh, I don't want to leave the, the answers, but you kind of, Chief Tate kind of mentioned something that allows your officers to actually spend more time on calls, even though that crime is down, um, you know, that, that seems uh, to be a, a noble aspiration and something that's maybe being accomplished through this, but is there specific internal goals and specific external goals? Did you see this real, happen? Yeah, real, quick, real quickly, I guess some internal goals uh, would be to reduce, you know, some of those, those most, our most severe cases that have frustrated officers for years mm -hmm. that some of them we have been very, very close to using deadly force in. Um, we all have stories, and mm -hmm. these individuals have had weapons, and one I referred to, uh, she held up a bank with a, a firearm. It's that kind of case if we can um, reduce our involvement in it, in, in a lot of these cases should not have a uniformed officer mm -hmm. responding. Uh, to deal with some of these problems. That's not the best way to handle uh, that call for service. So triaging that, lowering our um, repeat calls for service to a specific individual, getting them the help they need, and so you don't see them on the call sheet anymore. I think there are other, again, um, types of things that we're looking at in terms of overdoses in our, in our community and, and the outreach we can do uh, with those individuals who we usually see again after we've narcan them, uh, is there a way that we can get them into a treatment, into, into some type of services? So uh, 
internally, I think that's the other goal. I think that was important was making sure everybody that this worked from a fit standpoint, mm -hmm. and that our officers were comfortable going up uh, to Jameson, visiting him in his cubicle, and sharing that information. And I think that's happened. Uh, we've met that goal probably week one. Mm -hmm. Probably had five five names in the community uh, <laughs> sitting on his desk before he even you know signed into the computer. So uh, officers were glad to to see them and and. I think internally that was that goal was met right away. But um, reducing call, repeat calls for service, getting people uh, resources that they need, and especially some of the folks that we've been real close to having to use force on. That's the last thing we want to do. I don't know if you guys have. No, I agree. I think uh, you know there's liability reduction, whether it's mm -hmm. out in the street yeah. for our officers by having these resources and getting people on the right track, versus something horrible happening or something happening in our jail that. Once again, looking at these jail numbers, is some of that because we're treating people better and helping them get on the right foot versus ending up in, in the systems and then we incur liability with all those interactions. Um, I think another piece, as uh, we've talked about the survey and the, the cops, they expect this, they want this, and as we're all hiring and recruiting, this is another piece that helps us retain people, mm -hmm. shows we're, we're doing best practices, we're a good place to work, we're not, essentially hanging the officer out there either by making them go to these calls without any resources behind the scenes to help them. And I think that's appreciated by the staff and I think will reflect in some of our retention issues that will be improved by having more resources available. I think for us with, within Health and Human Services, some of our drive for this was really to partner in a better, different way. I think um, we've been looking for ways to help support law enforcement and we've been hearing sort of those struggles over the last, well, at least since I started here nine years ago, of just sort of this unmet need. And so how do we meet the needs of that person who's in the community? How do we support our law enforcement officers? And then hopefully how do we maximize the efficiency of the system that we have locally, whether that's our private providers or our nonprofits, um, our hospital system, all of that. How can we use this as sort of a link to connect those pieces together and sometimes to make up for those shortfalls when we don't have resources. And just a, a follow-up question, uh, if I may. Talked about, I heard tools in a tool belt, tools in a toolbox. This is another new tool um, for us. Not It's not a new tool out and about, right? It's new, new to us. In the four months or whatever it's been, um, do you and your the groups that you represent feel like this is one of those more transformational type tools, both internally and externally, that actually moves the needle and changes people's lives for generations? Um, I know it's, again, new to us, but not new out and about in society. Is that, does, it, does it rise to that kind of level? I think it's a new paradigm shift from the way we used to do things back in the day to where now we have the resources available to help us, where all these legislative mandates, and I don't want to get off on a tangent, but all these unfunded legislative mandates put, put these problems on the desk of law enforcement. Now it, it, it makes us think outside the box, how can we work, how can we communicate, how can we partner? And we've done that with the county and the, the various law enforcement agencies uh, in Scott County. And I brag about it everywhere I go in the state of Minnesota. And they say, how can you get along with the county so well? I said, why not? <laughs> oh, what's, what's the problem? But this is a prime example of a successful program, even though it's in its infancy and we're building a strong foundation, that the paradigm shift has really turned towards Community safe, safety, officer safety, getting people help when they need it. And that, that's, that's our huge goal. Now, when I first met Jessica, her and Amber came in to our annual department meeting and we hit it off right away, except when she said she's a Green Bay Packer. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. That's, that ruined wow. everything. No, I mean, <laughs> No, but it's been great. It's been great. We've Excuse seen me. absolutely some impact of this. Um, it does definitely, I think, have opportunity for more of that transformation. I think it will require that evolution over time of how do we make sure that we're building in those system efficiencies um, so that this isn't a standalone program, but it's working across our continuum um, so that everybody's doing their part. Thank you. Okay. I think that's, uh, is that everything? Okay.
Good. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming today, and thank you for the great presentation. We sure appreciate it. And